this afternoon, we have uh, our first speakers uh, who are Alexandra Wehmeyer and Sebastian Arnold from University of Freiburg. And they will be talking about chimeric 3D gastroloids, a versatile tool for studies of mammalian perigastrulation development. So Sebastian and Alex, please, uh, the floor is yours. So first of all, I want to thank uh, the journal development and also uh, Matthias uh, for the opportunity to present the current manuscript of uh, Alex sitting uh, next to me and she will also present the story. And um, so this is more a technical approach um, to ask uh, and address some of the questions that uh, we are working on. And we hope that this is also um, uh, showcasing a little bit how we uh, suggest to use gastroloids in a slightly more advanced manner as uh, previously done. So uh, to give you a, really a minimal background of the questions in the lab, uh, this is a schematic here of a gastrulation stage um, mouse embryo and some in situ harmonizations for some of the signals that are shown here on the right-hand side, um, which are expressed in the PIMT district region, some of the transcription factors. And these transcription factors together with the signals, they guide morphogenetic processes and cell lineage specification. We are specifically interested in activities of these T-box transcription factors shown here, Bachiui, and um, which are well known for their instructive functions as uh, lineage specifiers. And so this uh, schematic here really illustrates years of work uh, that we and many others did on, on these transcription factors and shows that EMAs is a transcription factor that regulates the um, specification of mesoderm above this level here, which is indicated at the heart. And uh, so it specifies cranial mesenchyme and cardiac mesoderm and the entire definitive endoderm. And the second T-box transcription factor, Brachiuri, is acting slightly later and more posterior in the embryo to specify, for example, partial mesoderm, the axial mesoderm. And it's well known for its function in the actual elongation process, which depends on neuromesodermal progenitor. So in combination, these two T-box transcription factors account for actually the specification of more or less all the mesoderm and endoderm in uh, the embryo. And so in the last years, and, and we and many others, we of course depended on um, the usage of, um, of, of mouse genetics. And we analyzed the functions of these factors in loss of function targeted genetic approaches in the mouse embryo. But this is very limited because for example, you cannot really address molecular mechanisms. And, and especially when it comes to the um, um, disentangling of uh, transcription factor functions versus for example, signaling molecule functions, you, you run into problems using embryos, you're just too limited. So that's why we were very happy to learn um, how other people used um, uh, embryonic stem cell-based systems. And we also started using embryo bodies, but then really um, uh, got fascinated by the beauty of the self-organization of gastroloids, all started with the initial paper from Alfonso Martinez Ariel's lab in 2014. And so Alex will present to you some example of how we use and reiterate the gastroloid model. Yes, I will um, take over a brief overview of the in vitro model we use, gastroloids. They were established in 2014, and they are made from a defined number of embryonic stem cells that aggregate and are stimulated with a Kier pulse that uh, induces wind signaling and um, leads to symmetry breaking, um, excess elongation and germ layer specification. And these gastroloids recapitulate the transcriptional programs of the gastrolating mouse embryos roughly from embryonic day 6.5 to 9.5. And in our project, we aim to expand the experimental potency of uh, gastroloids uh, by integrating functional genetics in mouse embryonic stem cells and generating chimeric gastroloids to study transcription factors uh, functions. And um, in chimeric embryos, usually loss of uh, gene functions are uh, utilized. And the in vitro approach also allows us to um, use gain of um, function modifications. And we use exemplary uh, the gain of function eomus stem cells. So in these ES cells, eomus is coupled to a tet responsive element. So we can control a, a gene expression via doxycycline. And exemplary for loss of function genetics, we use um, brachiuri knockout AS cell lines with, that carry a homozygous deletion. And in chimeric gastrolytes, we combine these genetically modified AS cells with wild type AS cells 
and uh, we tested two approaches to generate them either by merging two preformed aggregates or by mixing cells in the beginning of gastroreformation. Here I visualize these two approaches, uh, including a little uh, time-lapse uh, video of the merging process. And merging can be applied, for example, when the behavior of a coherent group of cells is analyzed uh, for instructive gene function, for example, while mixing can be applied when uh, the, the cell autonomous functions of a few mutant cells in a wild type environment is studied. And as you've seen on the slide before, we use fluorescent membrane labels, which allows us to uh, distinguish the different genetic backgrounds in our chimeric gastroloids. And uh, here we usually use membrane GFP tag wild type cells and genetically modified air cells with a, a membrane tomato um, label. And uh, here are just two wild type gastroloids showing that these labels don't affect normal gastroid formation. And over the next few slides, I want to present you uh, three examples uh, that demonstrate the experimental potential of chimeric gastroloids. So in my first example, I want to show you how uh, they can be used to study instructive gene functions. And we know that EOMIS is uh, required for the specification of anterior mesoderm, including the cardiac lineage. And here I wanted to test if EOMIS also is also sufficient to induce a heart-like domain in chimeric gastroids. And for this, uh, for this I generated um, chimeras with YTAP in gain-of-function EOMIS cells and treated them not only with KIA but also doxycycline to induce EOMIS expression in these um, membrane um, MT cells. And uh, when we look at their development, we find that the induced cells form a coherent domain in these chimeras that is positioned at the anterior pole of the uh, gastroloid, uh, opposing to uh, the expression of posterior markers such as portal 2. And uh, indeed, after seven days of culture, we can see uh, that a beating domain emerges in these chimeras. Um, that consists mainly of these induced uh, uh, cells that overexpress illness, and we only rarely observe this in uninduced controls. And uh, to correlate the beating domain with the expression of heart markets, we performed in situ hybridization for MLC2A and MKX25, and which confirmed that illness is indeed uh, sufficient to um, induce a heart like domain in these chimeric gastroids. So in the second example, um, I show you how I use cameras to analyze prahiuri function during axis elongation. So um, when we generate gastroids only from, from prahiuri mutant cells, they fail to elongate. Um, and this is similar to what we see in mutant embryos, where, which also fail to undergo posterior axis uh, elongation. And first, I tested whether mixing an increasing amount of wild type cells to the pahiuri mutant cells would rescue the phenotype at some uh, of axis elongation at some point. And indeed, we can see this. So, with uh, cameras uh, that have a high contribution of pahiuri mutant cells, they show a reduced axis elongation. Uh, uh, but at a 50 50 mixing ratio, uh, the phenotype is uh, basically restored and looks similar to the wild type situation. And if we look at the Prahiuri expression patterns now in these chimeras, um, we see that in chimeras with a high uh, contribution of Prahiuri mutant cells, also Prahiuri expression is reduced and less refined. And also in wild type cells here at the posterior pole, for example, at 120 hours, the um, Prahiuri expression is missing, which suggests that the Prahiuri mutant cells affect the wild type cells in a cell non autonomous manner. And this might be due to a disturbed wind signaling environment, because we know that uh, Prahiuri and wind 3A regulate each other via feed uh, positive feed forward loops. And um, to test this, we again performed in situ hybridization for wind 3A. And this uh, also confirms that um, wind 3A expression in chimeric gastrolytes is. Um, reduced and mislocalized compared to the wild type situation. 
Um, so in this uh, third example, uh, after examining uh, the cell non-autonomous effects, uh, we, we check for cell autonomous effects of brachyurea deficiency. And if we look at uh, chimeric uh, gastroids made from wild type and brachyurea mutant cells, we always find a distinct a distribution pattern of the brachyurea mutant cells, and they accumulate predominantly at the posterior pole and along the midline. And this actually recapitulates also observations that um, made in the in chimeric embryos, where a similar pattern can be found. And now we wanted to check the cell fate of the regions where these uh, the brachyurea mutant cells accumulate. For this, we performed immunofluorescent staining for different germ layer markers for FOXA2 definite endoderm, SOX2 for neurotube progenitors, FOXC2 for mesoderm, and again correlated this to our membrane labels. And uh, we, we find here that the brachyurea mutant cells um, contribute to primitive gut sheet like structures and um, to neurotube progenitors. And to sum this up, I've presented you with uh, the chimeric gastroid model, which is a versatile and rapid tool to study gain and loss of gene functions, as I've shown you for the instructor, uh, instruction of a heart uh, domain. These cameras allow to provide regulatory cues for tissue types that are usually missing or underrepresented in the conventional gastroids. And uh, we can use cameras to analyze cell autonomous um, versus non-autonomous fun functions. And uh, yeah, we are now planning to use the system further to also study molecular function of the T-box transcription factors in the primitive streak. Um, with this, I want to thank every, uh, everyone in the lab, especially people involved in the project, Simon, Katrin, and Alex Conrad. And, um, I want to thank Michael Kieber for the ES cells and um, our collaborators and funders. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Sebastian and Alex, for this exciting overview of the latest development in gastroloid research. We now have a time for a couple of questions, and I see that there is already one question in the Q&A, so I'm, I'm reading it now. Does GFP-RFP labeling specifically the membrane make distinguishing the two labeled cell types easier, or do you think it would be easy enough to distinguish them if proteins in different parts of the aggregate of the cell were tagged? Um, I think uh, the membrane labels are, are, are sufficient to uh, distinguish them and are, um, well, they have proven to be very useful. I, 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 um, compared to, you know. No, I, I, to be honest, I think uh, one could use also other labels. I mean, what you, these are rather large structures, right? So if you want to um, image details, I mean, probably it could be complicated, but also in the way how we presented it, uh, we we rather gave overview, so I, I think you could use a cytoplasmic uh, XFP or whatever. I mean, it does. I think for for the type of approach that we chose here, you could use any other type of uh, cell label as well. If that was the question, question if I understood correct. Yeah, I think so. Do the brachyuri mutant cells behave different based on their spatial location? A question from Garov Bardwine. You want to answer? Yeah, so so let me answer. So uh, the, the reason why we chose that approach of, of making these chimeras, as you would also do it in embryo, is, is, is really our, um, uh, was that we wanted to dissect cell autonomous versus non-autonomous functions um, and expected that we would uh, get random mixture of mutant and white type cells in the same location to ask these questions. Um, it seems that the brachyurea mutant cells sort themselves into different regions, um, which is a little bit difficult to understand why they're sitting in the posterior, because this is actually, you would probably have expected the opposite, but it reflects also what's happening in the embryo. So what you need to do to really disentangle the transcription factor function of brachyurea from the environment is, I think, to look sufficiently early when you still have regular mixture between white type and mutant cells. And what we have shown is it's probably too late to address molecularly 
what is the impact of the lack of brachyuri in comparison to the signaling environment where the cells are sitting. So usually brachyuri acts together with wind and, and we want to tease it apart. So uh, I think you need to look earlier to, to get a clear answer on the question earlier than what we have shown here. And that's what we're doing actually, so. Okay. Uh, Maria Bellen uh, Favarolo asks, is it possible to see cellular migration using the gastrolytes? I guess this is one of the prime advantages of the system in, in, in theory, right? Do you want to answer that, Matthias? No, you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, because you, I mean, you probably did it even more than, than yeah, of course. I and mean, that's, so, so uh, in the paper, we don't have time-lapse movies actually, but of course we, you can do time-lapse imaging and um, it depends on your system, probably you would uh, use a light sheet approach for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I mean particularly because you have a relatively, I mean, in some cases you have very few mutant cells that could be very nicely tracked. No, that is exactly the light beauty. sheet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the beauty. If you, uh, if you take single cells, you can really follow them precisely. And, and the, that's what the membrane label is actually there for, to, to visualize the cellular migration. I mean, you could also take an actin, for example. We have life act GFP or things like that. That also works nicely, but these membrane labels are pretty good. Maybe two final questions. One from Luca Braccioli. Um, great talk. Do you observe specific differences when starting with aggregates versus single cell suspensions? No. Um, so the question is why these two different approaches, if I, if I get yeah. the question like that. And um, no, of course, I mean, what you can do if you, if you make these preformed aggregates is that you can really, for example, specify already the anterior portion versus the posterior portion as we do if we uh, induce expression of illness, for example. It, does, it, 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 it makes an anterior portion of a gastroloid. So, um, and, uh, but interestingly, um, if you mix the cells and do it, the outcome looks like the outcome looks like similar, whereas the starting point is different. So what is it? And, and that is, I think, the beauty of self-organization. The cells sort themselves where they belong, and um, and but but at the beginning, the the, the, the gastroid can look quite different and do look quite different if you make, for example, these pre-aggregates or mix the cells. I mean, obviously they they are different, but. Um, we can observe self-organization using these different approaches. Cool. Last question from Isabel Palacios. Um, how did, did you, well, no, and cell sorting, is it due to cell adhesion differences or physical aspects of the system? Cell adhesion differences. Did you look into that? No, <laughs> quick answer, no. I mean, um, cell adhesion differences, yeah, no, it, that's, a, that's a very, very, very interesting question. How that really works, um, we would we wish we could give a good answer to that, but I, uh, yeah, not yet. Great. So, well, thank you very much, Sebastian and Alex, for a wonderful talk and discussion.